Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast, episode number 19. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for yet another episode of the White Knuckle Podcast. Today, I am joined with Mr. Don Higgins from Higgins Outdoors, Inc., which is essentially a whitetail land consulting company. Um, Don can come out to your place and uh, sort of take the temperature of the property and uh, give you an idea if he can help you, first of all. And uh, once he can ascertain whether or not he can help you, uh, he can then give you his plan. Don also is part owner in a company called real world wildlife seeds and today i get to sit and talk with him about food plots land management planting trees and just about anything related to taking care of your property and making it into the best possible property for hunting whitetails But before we get the show on the road, just a quick announcement. Please listen for a special announcement at the end of the show where we're going to do a couple of giveaways. With that, let's get the show started. Here is my conversation with Mr. Don Higgins. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the White Knuckle Podcast. With me today on the other end of the line on Skype is Mr. Don Higgins. Don, how are you today? I'm great. Glad to be with you. Great. Thank you. Um, So... Don, you're involved in Higgins Outdoors, uh, which is uh, basically a whitetail land consulting business, and you're also involved with Real World Wildlife Seed. Uh, I can understand why you got in the uh, the outdoors management, but how did you end up in the outdoor seed, or excuse me, the food plot seed business, basically? Well, it's kind of a unique story, really. Um... You know, Higgins Outdoors is a company that uh, I started about uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I had a day job, which I really didn't care for. Always been an outdoors person. I grew up uh, pretty much a farm boy. And uh, I got a job in town, had that for 20 years, and was always looking for a way out. And uh, I started Higgins Outdoors. Basically, uh, we was doing, uh, we were contractors planting CRP acreage into uh, trees and native grasses. Um, I I promise you, I've planted more trees than anyone in the hunting industry. Uh, I've literally planted millions of trees by myself. In fact, just yesterday, well, actually every day this week until the rain hit last night, uh, I was on tree planting jobs. But I've I've literally planted millions of of trees and shrubs, seedlings across the Midwest on various conservation projects. And and that uh, kind of just uh, took my interest in land management to a new level when I started that business uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, the food plot seed uh, end of things was one that I, I was really uh, kind of disappointed in the products that were being offered to uh, deer hunters back at uh, more than a decade ago. Um, there was a lot of things, a lot of tricks being pulled by seed companies that would never fly in the farming community. Uh, a farm boy like myself, you know, we know how to read a seed tag and uh, we can tell a good product from the bad. And then that seed tag is more important than the fancy packaging. Whereas the, uh, a lot of the, the, the seed products were being marketed uh, through fancy ad campaigns, celebrity endorsements, things like that. But the product, what was actually in the bag, left a lot to be desired. And my business partner, Kevin Boyer, and I just, uh, Kevin's a farm boy himself, too, and we just saw an opportunity to use education as a marketing tool to, to teach deer hunters uh, about seed blends and what to look for on the seed tag, things like that, and to put out the quality line of products. Um, we wanted our products to be able to stand side by side with anything offered on the market, and that's kind of been the driving force uh, behind that and just kind of fit hand in hand with the other habitat work that I was doing. A lot of the customers that are hiring me to plant trees on their CRP acreage or whatever are also uh, customers that that plant food plots on their properties. So it all kind of went hand in hand, and 
uh, that's kind of how the ball got rolling on Real World. So you you mentioned um, some of the the fancy packaging, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Etc. What what is it that sets real world apart from uh, the competition? I guess. Well, first of all, the the seeds that real world sells are the are the, the very same blends that that I plant on my own property that Kevin plants on his. Uh, we spend a lot of, use up a lot of our food plot acreage on test plots, but uh, when it comes right down to it, well, we we want our best plots in in the same seed that we're selling. Um, we, we don't use any cheap filler seed, which is a trick that some companies use. They'll, they'll have, for instance, on their clover, they'll have some good clover seed in there, but then they'll have, they'll mix in some cheaper filler seed to cut their cost down. And we want the very best seed possible in those blends. Um, you know, another trick is they'll use excess seed coating. Seed coating is cheap. It's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. And uh, it really helps with germination and such. But you you only need, you know, 5% at the most uh, seed coating uh, by weight in that package. And there's some seed companies that are literally putting 50% seed coating uh, on their products, basically to drive their costs down and their profit margins up. So we try to stay away from things like that. But also, uh, we want to educate the consumer. We want We don't want to just have them take our word for it that we're offering the best products out there available. We would like for them to be able to to learn to read a seed tag where, you know, they walk into the store and they can compare any brand, uh, whether it be real world or another, just by reading that seed tag. So essentially, they're filling up their bag with 50% of not completely unuseful stuff, but by and large, not all of it's very useful, is what you're saying. And uh, conversely, you're putting more of the real stuff in it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we're giving them more. For example, if, if we just look at clover products, uh, you know, in a one acre bag, we're offering 10 pounds uh, of product where most of our competition is using eight pounds. Well, then you take it a, a couple steps further that, that eight pounds that the competition is offering. Well, just about all of them are using anywhere from 30 to 50% seed coating, where we're using 2%. So you subtract that, uh, say, 50% from your eight pounds of seed. Well, now you're down to four pounds of seed in that eight-pound bag. Well, well, then you take out the cheap filler seed. Say maybe half of their seed is good seed and half of it's uh, a cheaper filler seed. Uh, you know, a trick some companies use is they'll mix annual clovers with perennial clovers. So you plant that stuff, and and next year, where those annual clovers were, where you, you just have bare spots because they don't come back. So, you know, it's it's tricks that they're using that would never fly in the ag industry because the, the farmer's been educated on how to read seed tags, where the deer hunter has not. And we're just trying to, to bring that education to the deer hunter. And uh, when when they pick up a tag, we want to make sure, and when they learn how to read seed tags, we want to make sure that, that, that they can see the difference when they read our tag compared to the competition. Okay. Well, that, that, that makes complete sense. I can understand a farmer, you know, when they, they're putting something in the ground, they're doing it for the return right. on their investment or to feed their animals, so it's in their best interest to make darn sure that they've got um, what it is that they're, they're paying for in the ground. And it sounds like that's that's kind of what you're doing. You you mentioned um, the earlier you mentioned germination rate and how how does how does more seed? It seems to me that more seed would just mean more germination. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yes, it, it is. Uh, we can we can kind of take that a step further. You know, those seed tags actually also are required by law to list the germination rates. I mean, the law requires a seed. A seed tag, a seed be retested every 12 months. So the the seed tag will have a test date on it, and that test date, if it's over 12 months old, the the company is required to retest that seed. And with each subsequent retesting, the germination rate is going to drop to a certain degree. Now, sometimes it may be minimal. Uh, a lot of seed will keep from year to year. But uh, it, it's not against the law to sell seed that, that's old, outdated, as long as the test is current, which reflects the germination rates. 
And then that's another trick that some of these companies are doing. They're using seeds with poor germination rates, you know, 70% or so, when uh, most of the time they should be in the 90%. Uh, and, and there again, you know, you, you plant that stuff and you're not getting as many plants because it's just it's simply not germinating. It sounds to me like when we're looking at those seed tags, we need to look at how much of that entire bag is filler. Um, and it could be seed coating or whatever uh is whatever else is the filler and then you also it sounds to me like you want to look at for a test date now i've never heard of, i've never heard of that before so this is news to me and, and i appreciate you taking the time to to uh to tell us about it what so a tag should have a test date on it right okay and that test date reflects when the manufacturer of that seed last tested the seed for its basically for its quality right they're testing germination rates purity you know they want to uh, determine if there's like uh, inert matter or weed seed or, or non-crop seed in that blend. You know that that seed that the the manufacturer is going through a mixer. If when they're mixing different blends, there may have been a different seed in the the mixer that got you know a couple seeds got hung up. And by law, you got to all that has to be listed on the seed tag. And, and what we try to get through to these deer hunters is you, you got to totally ignore the the package that uh, the fancy package the seed comes in. You just got to totally throw that out. And uh, the, the marketing behind it, you really need to forget some of that, too. And you just need to focus on that seed tag. That seed tag is going to allow you to do an accurate comparison across the board for, of one brand of seed to another. It's going to tell you exactly the germination rates, exactly the, the species of seed that's in there. Uh, it'll tell you the origin of the seed. It'll tell you when that last seed uh, test was done. And and that will really allow you to compare products across the board and compare them fairly. I mean, um, you know, it's one thing to, to do your side-by-side -side comparisons in the field, which we've done plenty of that too. But when you look at that seed tag, that's really telling you what you're spending your money on or what you're getting for your money. You know, I'm, I'm in the car business and have been for a long time. It sounds like comparing window stickers on new cars. Uh, very similar. You know. Yep. Yeah, it, I would I would say there's a lot of parallels there. Well, that's that's really interesting. I had no idea that um, you. I, I had no idea that you could sell a uh, a perennial and an annual in terms of clover together. Why would what value is that to anyone that's planning a food plot? I mean, is there any value to buying something with a annual in it? Uh, I don't believe there's any benefit. I mean, it's a cheaper seed. It, it, basically, what the the companies are doing is they're trying to they're trying to invest as little of their money as possible into that product so that their profit margins are higher. You know, real world uh, seed, we've had a real issue getting our seed into major retail uh, chains. And the reason for that is we've got so much more invested in, in our product that the profit margins are not near as high. So, so we can't go into a you know, a big name chain store and compete with these guys who have only a few dollars invested in their product when we have twice as much invested in a bag of the, of the same product. For example, clover products, you know, I, I, I promise you we've got at least twice as much invested in a one acre bag of our clover product as our competition does. And for guys that, that have learned to read the seed bag, it's very obvious, you know, where that's at, you know, you know the better germination rates, uh, the higher quality seed. We're not mixing in cheap filler seed. We don't have the excess seed coating. And, and all that's revealed on, on these seed tags. And, and what's really ironic here in the last year I've noticed is that some of these companies, their seed tags or, or the, the analysis stickers that they'll put on some of these bags, the type has gotten so small where you almost need a magnifying. They're required by law to put it there. That's why it's there. They cannot deny that information being made public. It's got to be on their, their product by law. So what they've done is now they've made it so small that you almost have to bring a magnifying glass to the store to see it. In essence, it sounds to me like you're being penalized because you're, you're, providing, mo you're providing more. Yeah, you, you could look at it like we're being penalized. We just look at it as if our, our business is growing. I mean, we're more than doubling every year, and we're in our ninth year in business. Uh, it, it's become a full-time job for four people in, in the spring when we're shipping a lot of seed out. And, and our growth has been slower but steady. 
And once we get people on board, once we teach someone how to read a seat tag, uh, a lot of times they're a customer for life. And not only are they a customer for life, they're a salesman for us. They're, they're telling their friends, hey, this stuff that you're buying down here at the at the big box store, you need to read the label. Check out your label compared to this label. And, and we're just using education and uh, to, to slowly build a business and to slowly build our uh, our customer base. And it's working fantastic. We, we still got a lot of, of, of room to grow and uh, we're still growing, but we would rather take that approach and be able to sleep at night knowing that uh, we're doing the right thing than to, to make a quick buck and, and get our product in every big store because we've got a network of dealers that's growing uh, by the day. There's not uh, hardly a day goes by that we don't get a new uh, request from someone wanting to be a dealer. Um, Kevin Boyer's in charge of setting up our dealer network and, I'm telling you what, it's a full-time job for him just to handle dealers, and that's all he's doing. And uh, it's about all he can handle. So so we're growing, and we're happy with it. And we've just found that, you know, you don't go to the to Walmarts of the world and buy a Matthews bow, and there's a reason for that. You know, Matthews is the highest quality out there, and you go to a Matthews dealer, and you may pay a little more, but you're getting a lot more. And we've kind of taken that same approach with our seed, you know, we don't, we're not going to have the cheapest seed out there, but we're going to have the best. We're going to do everything we can to have the very best seed products out there. Okay. So I think uh, you, you made your point pretty well and educated us pretty well in terms of what it is to look for when you have decided what you want to plant. How, how is it that one should go about looking at what to plant? I guess that's what I always struggle with. I'm, uh, I'm a, a hunter in, uh, you know, a, a very ag rich area. So there's soybeans everywhere. There's, uh, you know, corn everywhere. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm that unlike a whole lot of other folks in the Midwest that there's, you know, generally speaking, if you're, you know, um, in, in the Midwest, you're probably going to be in agricultural areas. What, what, what would you, uh, what would you recommend, uh, in, in terms of planning when you, when you're competing with those bigger, food sources well and that's a very good question one i deal with all the time you know as a consultant i'm always traveling around the midwest meeting with various landowners and, and trying to help them set their property up to be the best it can be and as i travel to these these various properties when i get close to a, a person or a client's property i'm really focused in on the other properties around that area and, and what is available to the deer now sure i'm not going to be able to see everything from the road as i drive in but I can get a pretty good feel for an area uh, just by uh, observing as I drive in. And when you're picking foods for your food plot, you want to do something different than everybody else in your area is doing. Uh, I mean, if you're, say, you're in an area where there's a lot of, of dairy farms, there's a lot of alfalfa being grown, well, your clover is not going to compete with alfalfa. So you need to to just stay away from that. You need to provide something to the deer on your property that they can't find elsewhere now you mentioned the ag and uh you know one of our biggest selling products is our soybean blend and here in the midwest where we're at we're in a heavily agricultural area where there's plenty of soybeans grown but how many of those soybeans are available or or, uh to a deer say in the late season after the harvest soybeans are gone there may be plenty of soybeans out there all summer and in the early fall but what about december and january how many soybeans are there so what a, a landowner needs to look at, he needs to look at what's available to the deer, not on his property, but in his area. And then he also needs to focus on when he wants that available. Is he an early season hunter? Uh, you know, food plots, uh, a complete system of food plots, you'll, you'll want greens and grains. And my favorite uh, grains by far is soybeans. And then greens, uh, there's a lot of different things. We've got a blend we call harvest salad. Uh, that's got uh, oats, rye, winter wheat, and Austrian winter peas. That, that's really great for the greens. But you, you want to take a look at uh, when you want that available. Greens are great when the weather is warmer in the early season. The colder it gets, greens are, are the attraction. So you want to look at what's available in your area, and then you want to factor in when you want to uh, when you want to focus your hunting. Okay. And kind of combining those two to make your choice. I hunt 
just for example, in an area that's just high, highly um, uh, dairy farms, just lots of dairy farms. So you're right. There is a lot of uh, there is a lot of alfalfa. Why does an alfalfa compete with clover? Yeah, there is there is nothing more nutrient rich than alfalfa as far as crops go. Um, you know, it'll be high in protein and total digestible nutrients. The calcium levels will be up. Uh, clover just can't compete with it, and nor can anything else. You know, clovers or alfalfa is the one thing that uh, will pull deer out of soybeans in, in the summertime. And we know how deer love the soybeans in the summer, but there's just nothing that can, you can grow that can compete with the quality of, of the nutrient-rich uh, alfalfa. And that's why it's fed to dairy cows. I mean, those cows producing all that milk require the highest nutrition possible to do that. And alfalfa fits the bill, and, you know, it also fits the bill for those bucks growing giant racks or, or does producing fawns. And so nothing you can, can grow will, will compete with alfalfa. But the thing about alfalfa is, uh, you know, once it gets a hard frost or two on it, it starts losing its palatability, and, and deer start looking for other food sources. And that's where you need to focus if you're in an area with a lot of alfalfa. You need to focus a little bit later in the season when the, the deer are off of that alfalfa and are looking for the grains or something else. Is there one thing that you would recommend when you've got a guy or gal or whomever uh, that's just got a small area? And again, they're going to compete with all those bigger fields. Is there any product that you would recommend? Um, again, let's let's assume that there's, there's beans and corn. Now, albeit the, those beans and corn are going to be gone by the middle of November, um, the good Lord willing, um, they'll be gone. What What is it, if you had a half acre, what, what would Don Higgins plant in that half acre if you were in the Midwest, um, you know, and, and you're competing with all those grain fields, et cetera? Well, that, that's a very easy question. We, we've just came up with a new blend. Um, it's actually a combination of our two best-selling fall products over the years, which was our harvest salad and plot topper. And a lot of, of our customers have been combining those two products in the same plot for many years. We've done it ourselves, but we've started packaging them together this year, and we call it Deadly Dozen because there's 12 different plant species in that mix. Everything from the cereal grains I talked about earlier, the oats, the winter wheat, the rye, the Austrian winter peas, and then you got your uh, the, the turnip, sugar beets, radish, uh, and those products as well. And when you plant that deadly dozen combination, you've got something in that plot that's palatable from the time it starts to germinate clear through till the next spring. So it doesn't matter if you're hunting that plot on opening week in 1st of November or in the middle of the rut or the late season. There's something in that mix of 12 different plants that's going to be palatable and attractive to the deer at every point of the season. So if I only had one plot, that's exactly what I would plan. In in that situation, do you ever have the concern, and I've heard this from, from different folks around, do you ever have the concern that if it hasn't been something that's been planted in there you know, in that geographical area before, in other words, they haven't eaten it before, like, uh, let's say the, the winter peas, um, is it, is it something that's going to take a while for them to catch on to, or would you, is it safe to expect that they're going to, if I go out and plant that this year, that they're going to, to, you know, be attracted to winter peas? Well, the the mix I'm I'm talking about, there, there's going to be something in that mix that, that gets the deer to eat it, so that they're going to find attractive. Okay. Of uh, those 12 plant species, they're going to start hammer something. And, and in the process, if there's something, and I know exactly what you're talking about, because when I first planted turnips on my property several years back, you know, the first year, those turnips were hardly touched. The second year, you know, they dibbled on them a little bit more. By the third year, they were devouring them. It took them a little bit to develop a taste for the turnips. So, you know, I, I get that comment all the time from customers. Uh, so I know exactly what they're talking about because I experienced it myself. But uh, in that mix of 12 different plant species, there's going to be something that gets the deer to stick their head in there and start eating it. And Say they're attracted to the winter wheat, for example. Well, at the same time they're eating that winter wheat, there's, right next to them is a, a sprig of Austrian winter peas or whatever. Well, they're just going to naturally take a bite of that to, to see if they like it, you know, just as they browse through the woods. So, uh, 
you know, I, there's no concern over planting that and not having the deer eat it. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's why there's a dozen plant species in there, I guess, right? Right. So in addition to, you know, planting the different seeds, et cetera, there's, there's more to it than that. What else should you, what else should you be concerned about prior to even putting it in the ground? Assuming you've decided on, uh, let's just say, for instance, the deadly dozen, what's, what's, what's important prior to putting that in the ground in, in terms of, of, of uh, preparation? Well, preparation is everything. Um, it goes way beyond picking your seed even. You need to, first of all, do you have a soil test done? I mean, there's not a farmer out there, and these guys are, are growing crops for a living. That Their whole livelihood depends on it. And, and these guys are out there testing their soil, fertilizing their soil, amending their soil with lime or whatever's needed to get the pH right. And, and a food plotter needs to do the same thing, especially when you're you're limited to the space. So if you've got, say, a half acre to work with and that's it, and that's, that's the only plot you're going to have on the property, you need to get that half acre to be – as productive as possible to put out as much volume of food for the deer as possible, but also of the highest quality. Uh, you know, if a plant grown on well-fertilized soil is going to be a whole lot more palatable than, than the same plant grown on poor soil. So you need to amend that soil with fertilizer, lime, whatever, to, to get it uh, in position to grow whatever crop it is that, that you're going to grow. Man, there's probably nothing more important. And it's so cheap. You know, you can do a soil test for under 10 bucks. It just takes a little bit of time and effort. And then you take the, the results from that soil test to your local fertilizer dealer and, and uh, you can get what you need and spread it on your pot and you're, you're ready to go. And that's a skip that so many people try to, or the step that so many people try to skip. And yet it's so important. Right. They just throw it in the ground and, hope that it that it grows yep. <laughs> um and, and taste you know there if i'm understanding you correctly it's it's more you know even if it does come out of the ground and it tastes like crap um they're just not going to eat it right and i'm not that that's an extreme example right no i get it but it, it, it is you know it is a real example yeah no i it really can't it, make, it makes sense i mean some restaurants are better than others and that's it's it's the same right. with food plots by the by the sound of the thing um i know real world uh you know offers a bunch of food plot seeds um but i also know that you offer different kinds of I'm going to call them warm weather grasses. Um, maybe they're cold weather grasses. You're, you're talking with a guy that doesn't know about a lot about the the grasses. But I, if if memory serves me correctly, in looking at your website, just uh, a buddy and I were doing that. Uh, we were taking a break from turkey hunting last week, and we were looking at uh, the website. And um, he's got some uh, fields that he's going to just turn into. He's going to try and turn into bedding. Um, what do you what do you offer for uh, those grasses that I that I'm talking about? If you were trying to establish something that didn't have a bunch of trees and brush on it for bedding, well, we've developed a a blend we call bedding in a bag, which includes uh, big blue stem Indian grass and switchgrass in the blend. But the thing to to keep in mind about those three species of grasses is there's several different varieties uh, within each species. For example, switchgrass. Uh, there's cave and rock switchgrass, which everybody knows. And, and there's, a, there's a dozen. There's probably, there's probably more than a dozen. There's 15, 20, who knows how many different varieties. And the same way with the Indian grass and the big blue stem. And what we did uh, at Real World is we just planted every variety that we could get our hands on side by side by side in test plots that were 50 foot by 20 foot. And we did this on multiple farms. And... We allowed those grasses to stand through the winter, uh, several different winters, and, and then we selected the, the variety of each species that uh, stood the best. And some of those grasses, uh, as soon as it gets the first little snow on them, they're going to lay flat to the ground. That's where they're going to lay all winter and have a hard time hiding a rabbit in it. And others are going to stand tall, and, and you can look the next spring, and they'll still be standing, providing plenty of cover for the deer. So I just want to caution people not to get hung up on the species. The species is important, but it's not near as important as the variety within the species. And that's where we made our selection to develop the bedding in a bag. And that's worked pretty well for you, it sounds like. Yeah, I think we're on about, uh, that was one of the products we first started with. 
Um, and the, the demand is more than doubles every year. In fact, I've probably taken at least, uh, here we are at noon, and I, I know I've taken at least three, if not four, calls this morning already just on that one product. So uh, it's been a huge hit. And, you know, as people try it and they love it and they, they tell their buddies, well, it just adds to more sales. And if it wasn't good, I'm sure that wouldn't be the case. But, uh, you know, we're real happy with it. I've got about 35 acres of it on my farm. Um, what I've found is that, that individual bucks, some of them will, will really love those grasses and they'll bed in those grasses almost daily. Other bucks will prefer the wooded cover a little more and that's where they stay. But, uh, if you, if you want to make bedding cover in a hurry, I don't know of any better way than these warm season grass. That that was going to be my next question. Is, is it is it realistic to think that I can go out on this twenty acres that my buddy and I talked about uh, and and plant that this spring and expect have the expectation that that's going to hold some deer? And it sounds to me like uh, it is. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the the thing about those grasses is typically. The thought is that it takes about three years to establish a good stand, but that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, the the first time I ever planted these grasses was, I don't know, it was oh, several, several years back. And I planted an eight-acre field on my farm in early May, used a no-till drill, and I, I drilled it into corn stalks. First experience I ever had with this stuff, but, uh, you know, I'd read that, that bucks like to bed in and such, so I tried it. And this was this was back before we even started the experiment, uh, you know, with the the side by side test with the different varieties. But anyway, I planted this in early May, and in October, you know, I was my first hunt right in the corner of this this eight acre field of these native grasses. Very first hunt, I watched eight bucks get out of that eight acre field and and stand up and walk out and feed in, into a food plot next to it. And then that told me just how valuable that was going to be uh, developing my own property. And they're just kind of taking it from there and run with it. And, and at that point, you know, I started realizing that some of those grasses stand better than others. And uh, we started doing the experiment to get uh, to find the, the best varieties to put in the bedding in a bag. But, you know, one thing I'll caution you about, everybody wants to know, well, how much cover is going to be there the first year? And that's really hard to say. I've seen stands where it was barely knee high the first year. And then I've seen others like the, the plot I just mentioned, the first one I did where it was eight foot tall over my head, uh, easily over my head the, the first fall. But the the quality of the soil, you know, the, the richer, more fertile soils, it's going to grow a little better and, and get taller. But what's really important that first year is, is the weather pattern. If, if you get a a summer where you get steady rains and you don't have any long drought periods, then you can get a good stand. I've seen many stands over six foot tall the first year, not just the one I was referring to on my property, but I've actually planted native grasses. I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, you know, for a living as a, as a conservation contractor, I've planted thousands of acres of these grasses across the Midwest. And I've seen a lot of stands that were over six feet tall the first year. So there, there's just way too many variables to say what you're going to get, but but you actually can get bedding cover in one year. Real World's also gotten into the um, mineral business, correct? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. I- well, I, uh, I I've been raising uh, some captive deer. I've got a research herd. Uh, have had them for over 20 years. Uh, I focused my research. It's not scientific. It was more me just trying to be the best deer hunter I possibly could and learn as much as I could about whitetails that I acquired a few captive deer and have been studying them. And I, I focused my studies on nutrition and genetics. Um, I, I, like I mentioned, I've been a farm boy all my life. I've raised livestock and I thought, well, shoot, it'll be simple for me to uh, put a feed ration together and grow some giant bucks. And what I found right out of the gate was I needed to forget everything I knew about feeding cattle because it does not translate over to feeding deer. The deer are a totally different species, and even though they're both ruminants, uh, the nutritional requirements of, of each is totally different. And what I've learned is that how important minerals are uh, to a deer or any livestock, really, but to a deer also to their diet for them to, to produce to their maximum whether it be fawn production or antler production. 
And uh, through my experiments on, with my own captive deer over the 20 years, uh, we put together a, a mineral product uh, two years ago we called Maximizer. Uh, again, uh, if you can learn to read the, the analysis tags that are required by law, you can compare mineral products the very same way you do feed products. And uh, we put together what we feel is the very best mineral on the market and call it Maximizer. How, how important do you feel the, um, I guess, feeding, supplementing, whatever you want to call it, of, of mineral is to a herd? Well, it, uh, I, I get this question a lot, too. And, and people debate, you know, do, do minerals help deer or bucks grow bigger antlers and, and how much? And I'll put it like this. There's... I don't know, millions of cattle farmers in the United States and, and every cattle farmer, whether it's a dairy cattle farmer or a beef cattle farmer, every single one of them. And, and also it goes beyond cattle. It goes to the other livestock industries, hogs, whatever. Every one of them is feeding mineral product to their animals because there's been so much university and scientific studies done to prove the benefit of these minerals. And, and the benefits are, there's a long list of the benefits, you know, improved health, improved growth rates, improved conception rates, and it just goes on and on and on. The benefits have been proven to livestock. Now, when you think about it, this livestock that, that's getting this mineral is on these scientifically formulated diets, and they're in well-managed pa- pastures that have been fertilized for maximum production and everything, and yet there is still the benefit of, of these minerals. So it's, it's got to translate over to the whitetail. The whitetail do not have the benefits of uh, scientifically formulated rations and uh, the fertilized pastures and, and things that the cattle industry do. So that, so they've got a benefit to some degree. Now, what degree? You know, that's hard to say. Um, you get these guys that will say, well, there's never been a scientific study proven that, that minerals improve antler growth. Well, I can turn that back around. I can say there's never been a scientific study that proves that minerals don't help antler growth. And it's, it's impossible to say because you take a, a pen of captive deer, for example, and, and you feed them mineral and their antlers get a certain size. Well, how do you know what those antlers would have been without the mineral or vice versa? So it's, it's just a hard um, thing to prove the, the benefit, but there is a benefit, absolutely, no doubt about it. The bottom line is it's helping. Yeah, absolutely. You also do a little bit of uh, land management, and earlier you you alluded to the fact that you'd been out planting trees. If I can, just just pick your brain as long as I've got you on the phone here. Um, with respect to planting trees, and I've planted thousands. I don't know that I've planted a million, but I've planted thousands and thousands. And if I if I said that 10% of them were growing, um, I, I might be yeah. overstating the truth. But uh, what's what's the secret to getting those trees to grow? Any of us that have, have owned land and, you know, obviously we want to be good stewards of the land and and, and plant the right trees and, and do it the right way. What's the secret to getting those things to grow other than, you know, making a special deal with Mother Nature? Because she certainly is mm-hmm. going to control a lot of it. But, you know, what gives them the best chance out of the gate well a couple of things really one you need to start with a tree species that's going to do well in your area you you can't just you know the 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 deer industry is kind of uh oh i almost compare it to the fishing industry uh you know the more fishermen are caught with lures and fish ever were you got to catch the fisherman before you ever catch the fish. <laughs> and uh, you know the a deer hunter True. will spend you know untold gobs of money chasing his sport if he thinks it gives him a chance to kill a bigger buck and the the tree industry's caught on to that and there's been some tree species that were marketed as the next greatest thing for deer hunters and such but a deer hunter really needs to focus on tree species that are going to do well in his region um you know trying to plant uh, persimmon trees in northern michigan for example is probably not a good idea uh most of them are going to get are not going to survive um so you need to, to find to so start with a tree species that's going to do good in your area and forget the the hype and and uh, all this glorified stuff you may read about on the internet or magazines. Uh, you know, deer got by for thousands of years before man came along and started feeding them. So uh, Mother Nature has a way of taking care of them. So so take a look at uh, you know the native 
species that are doing well in your area. Pick a tree species that's, that's going to fit with your region. And then when it comes to planting that tree, you need to plant it when the tree's dormant. Don't, don't buy these trees that are already leafed out and, and plant them. It's, it's a real shock to their system. And they can handle that shock a whole lot better if that tree is dormant when it's planted. Um, you know, I, I had a tree nursery, too, for, for many years until I sold that two years ago uh, where we grew shade and landscape trees. And we would dig them and burlap them and, and uh, sell them to landscapers and plant them on various projects. And we, we always did that when the trees were dormant. We'd have to wait for them to lose their leaves in the fall. And we, we planted probably more trees in the month of December than any other, any other month. Uh, so plant those trees when they're dormant. If you're going to do a spring plant, you know, do it as early as you possibly can in the spring. Um, when that tree comes out of dormancy, it should be doing it as the weather is slowly warming rather than uh, you going out there in May or June and sticking a fully leafed out tree into the ground. That's a lot of stress on that tree. So you mentioned planting them in December. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've you done that and had success with it. I, I, I can't even tell you how many trees I've planted. Like I said, I, I literally have planted millions of trees. I don't know how many millions. Probably somewhere around, I figured a while back, somewhere around two to three million. I, I've planted potted trees. I've wow. planted burlap trees. And I've planted bare root trees. I've planted... I, I'd hate to guess how many different species of trees. Probably approaching over 50 for sure probably approaching a hundred and uh, I've done it all across the Midwest and I'm telling you by far the winter is the time to plant those trees and move them when they're dormant. I would have never guessed that. That's a good, good tip. So when you, when you go onto a, a property and you're, you're looking at a property in terms of consulting uh, and you're, you're looking at, you know, the cover versus food. Is there a specific ratio that you look for? Uh, no, not, a, not at all. What I'm looking for is to make that property the very best it can be. Uh, I want to find, uh, well, I, I describe it to, to my clients. Uh, you, you're looking at, uh, let's imagine you're looking at your property from an airplane. You're 30,000 feet up and you're looking down. Your property is nothing but one small square on a giant checkerboard of other squares. So we need to do everything we possibly can to get the deer to spend as many daylight hours as possible on your square. And that means you've got to do something different than the guys on the other squares. And and that what that is just changes from property to property. One guy, it might be food. We need to provide more food. We need to do it... To, we need to plant this and this because nobody else in the area is. And, you know, the next day I'm on a different property and, and this guy's in an ag country and there's food everywhere and there's, there's dairy farmers that's got alfalfa fields and there may be, uh, who knows, an orchard nearby and, and this and that. Uh, in his area, he needs cover. He needs to, to get those deer bedding on his property. So, you know, it's not a... There's, there's some folks that have a cookie cutter approach that, you know, here's what we do. We go on the property and we set up this little merry-go-round where the buck hits this food plot and he skips through this buck bed and area and he goes over and looks where these does bed and he hits this food plot. It's just not that simple. It's each property is unique and every plan that I put together for each property is unique. So uh, there's just no said answer so there's there's no there's no cookie cutter approach to to doing what you do and i guess that's probably why you have to visit each property and look at everything um from a from a fifty thousand foot view and and then start to drill down from there yeah that's exactly right and and actually i'm probably one of the only consultants in business that that kind of screens my clients because i i'm not uh just looking to take some guy's money. I want to make sure that I can provide him something of value for his money. He, he's trusted me to do that. And, and I don't, I take that trust serious. And so I've got a series of questions that, that I want to ask him. I want to make sure that his goals are in line with what's, what's reasonable and what I think that I can actually help him with. And I also want to see an aerial photo of the property before I ever visit, because you know, his goals may sound reasonable, but his property just lays out terrible where it's just not going to happen. And, and I just as soon address that for free in a couple of emails than to have the guy pay me and, and show up and have to break the bad news to him. You know, sorry, we're never going to make this work. So it's just a kind of a different approach I, that, that I've taken. 
uh, with my consulting. Well, that sounds like a good approach. I just want to circle back for a minute to the mineral and ask about your EHD technology. Where are you guys at with uh, the EHD and the mineral? We've actually just kind of brought it to market in the last year. <clears throat> but it's been in the testing phase for some time. There is science behind all this. This is just not uh, a couple of guys. And I, I didn't come up with this. It was the nutritionist that did it. But it's not just a couple of guys that dreamed up this idea. And there, there is solid science behind it. And Aaron can go into that. And I'm I'm talking science or uh, uh, independent third party uh, research from universities. Uh, there was just a study done at the University of Minnesota. Uh, with our product. Uh, this year, we're working on the one at the University of Florida and another one at the Kansas State University. So we're not just looking to sell snake oil. We're we're pushing the science behind this. It's all scientifically proven. Well, there you have it. My conversation with Mr. Don Higgins from Real World Wildlife Seeds and Higgins Outdoor Whitetail Consulting. It was a really fun conversation, and we touched on a whole bunch of different areas with respect to food plots and uh, warm season grasses, bedding areas, uh, all that kind of cool stuff. So we'll have Don back on the show again, uh, and we'll probably also have uh, the fellow that uh, did his EHD technology for him, and we'll pick his brain a little bit about the EHD technology. In the show notes, you'll be able to find all the web addresses for either Real World Wildlife Seeds or Higgins Outdoor Whitetail Consulting, and also a link to Don's bio. Well, there you have it, my conversation with Mr. Don Higgins. Thanks a lot, Don, for doing the show. I had a ton of fun doing it and look forward to doing another one. With that, I think we'll wrap up the show for the week. As I said at the start of the show, we had an announcement to make. So we haven't done one of these ever, so I'm going to try and make it as uncomplicated as possible. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to www.white knuckleproductions.com once there go to the main page scroll to the bottom on the right bottom hand side you will see newsletter go ahead and sign up for our newsletter signing up for our newsletter is all you've got to do to be entered for the drawing we will leave that open for two weeks two weeks from the date that this is released i will draw six total names five of which will get a new white knuckle hat one of which will get the new product from real world wildlife seed called the deadly dozen that's it pretty simple nothing else to ask while you're on our page if you feel so inclined go ahead and check out our new gear section and uh, also check out our film school if you haven't uh, taken a look at our film school on the 17th of june down at todd grass place in illinois we're going to be hosting a one-day film school without a doubt white knuckle is looking to expand their team this year and that is your ticket to an opportunity to compete for a spot on our team if you have any questions just go ahead and email me and use the email that's on our website website. Well, that just about wraps up our show. Before we let you go, though, we'd just like to thank the folks that support us. And those folks are Ozonix, undetectable, undeniable. Lone Wolf, your silent partner. Spartan Camera, you don't have to be there. Coons Engineering, Wicked Tree Gear. Vortex Optics, the force in optics. Land Pros, and Stick and Pick. Well, that about wraps things up for today's show. We'd like to thank again everyone for listening. For iPod, iPad, or iWhatever listeners, grab your phone or device and go to the iTunes store and search for the White Knuckle Podcast if you haven't already. That'll help you download the free podcast app that's produced by Apple. Subscribe to the show from that app. Every time that I produce a new episode, you'll get it downloaded right to your device. For Android listeners, do the same thing, except download the Stitcher app for free. Then search for the White Knuckle Podcast, and every time we produce a show, it'll show up there. For those of you who don't have a mobile device, you can always watch for us on any of our social media channels. We will always be posting it there. With that, we sincerely hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. That's the way that we get better at what it is that we do. That's about all we've got. Have a great rest of your week.